comes in. So uh, welcome to Space Artifacts podcast. I'm Michael Warner. And I'm Mark Yates. Keep reading. Hello. I need to say more, don't I? Um, both Michael and I are collectors of Apollo flown and unflown space artifacts. And the thrust of this podcast is really to share those items with you um, over a series of sessions. Excellent. And this session, we're going to call the manuals that saved Apollo 13. I'll lead you through. Take a deep breath. Look, look happy. You're on camera. So I just said now, and this episode, our first episode, is the manuals that saved Apollo 13. Now, Mark, what's in the news today that could be relevant to this topic? Well, I think one of the most fascinating bits is we're only two weeks away, hopefully, from the first launch of the SpaceX Dragon capsule, which is going to be the first time the Americans have been able to send up their own astronauts um, from U.S. soil since the shuttle was retired in 2011. That uh, that's the, nine really, years. Yeah, that's, that's dead exciting. So, uh, excellent. So, in a way, it's not identical, but they're going through the learning curve, or they've been going through the learning curve. Now it's... <laughs> astronauts uh, man craft uh, into lunar uh, orbit. Now, the manual here on my right is Apollo 9, and the manual on my left is Apollo 13. And these manuals talk to each other, and this is what is exciting. The manual for Apollo 13 is the Lunar Module Contingency Checklist, and you can see the cover of it on the screen at the moment. And next to it is the cover for the uh, Apollo 9 Lunar Module Evaluation Systems Checklist. And the burns that were so critical, the engine burns of the descent propulsion system of the lunar module was so critical to, to bringing the Apollo 13 craft back were first tested in Apollo 13. But before we look at Apollo 9, let's just listen a little bit to how the events unfolded uh, with Apollo 13. And the image on the screen at the moment you can see now is uh, of the uh, service module where the oxygen tank exploded. Um, and this image was taken as they were coming into Earth's orbit at the end of the mission. And it's the first time they'd seen the real damage to, to, to that, uh, those oxygen tanks. So Mark, I wonder if you could uh, talk us through a little bit the, the next image on the screen, which is the flight plan of Apollo 13. Yeah, absolutely. I think actually just before we, we, we jump to that slide, the, the, the photo of the, the service module being separated is actually interesting. Of course, that happened in every previous Apollo mission. But what's interesting here is actually that it's taken from the command module, but it's also still docked to the lunar module, which is completely out of sequence from any previous mission. The lunar module was never intended to come back to Earth. Um, it was going to be left in lunar orbit or actually discarded. And actually, there's, a, there's an interesting story which we'll come to about that, that particular issue with the lunar module. Now, on the next slide, what we're looking at is a what you would call by now in probably April 1970, a typical trip to the moon. Um, at this point, Apollo 13 was the fifth mission to the moon. Um, you know, Apollo 11 and 12 had already landed in, in the Sea of Tranquility and in the Ocean of Storms. Apollo 13 was following. The emphasis now was not just on beating the Americans to, uh, the Russians even, to the moon. Um, it was now going back in the name of science. Um, and Apollo 13 was gonna land in the Fra, Fra Moro Highlands, um, was going to stay longer and it was going to do more. So these missions were steadily becoming more capable. And in fact, you know, it was almost becoming routine. Uh, what was different in this flight was the fact that they were actually sending them out, launching them from the Earth on a, what was called a non-return trajectory. So on previous missions, by way of reducing risk, had none of the rocket engines worked, they would simply loop around the back of the moon and come back and by default, taking the hands off the controls, they would have re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Apollo 13, because of the, the landing site and where they were going to land, they had a slightly more bold trajectory, which, if uncorrected, they would have actually not, they would have gone around the side of the moon, but never returned back to the Earth. So there they are, flying out uh, on, on April the 11th, I believe it was, day two, and they stirred up one of their oxygen tanks. Oxygen, of course, was being used to provide breathing air breathing oxygen but also to help make, make water and produce power and that tank exploded uh, it erupted sent the craft uh, tumbling out of control caused a whole load of problems and very very quickly uh, the controllers had to try and understand what had caused the problem with very little information to go on 
um, information that was being relayed down to the ground in Houston and also what the crew was telling them themselves. Um, what they realized, of course, was that they needed, they were in dire trouble, okay? And they needed to actually get back into a free return trajectory that would get the crew back to work. So this was the key thing. And actually, they used a lunar module engine twice in a very unconventional mode. It had been uh, proven before on Apollo 9 that it could function in that mode. And the, third, and the final burn was a trim using some much smaller attitude control engines on the lunar module. Once it had gone around and reappeared from the other side of the moon. Perfect. Let's hold it there, Mark, and just bring in then on the back of that description, the Apollo 9 manual. So what's interesting about this manual is it's talking to the contingency lunar module checklist, uh, Apollo 13 on, on my left. Now, why are they talking together? Well, Mark just mentioned that critical was a docked dips burn. So dock, that's the lunar module docked to the command and service module, as you can see in the model just up here. And the dips is DPS pronounced dips, descent propulsion system burn. So they're burning the descent engine of the lunar module, intended to land the lunar module on the surface of the moon, but they're burning it in a configuration to first of all put the craft back on the free return trajectory around the moon, and then later on to uh, uh, speed up its return by 10 hours, change the location from the uh, Indian to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and uh, as Mark mentioned, then there's a final burn later on to, to trim the trajectory. Now, if you can see the image on the screen, you'll see in Apollo 9, we have Rushdie Schwagert there with Jim McDivitt. Rushdie is holding this particular manual, and it's a heavily annotated manual, one of the most heavily annotated of all the manuals that are out there um, in, uh, in collections, because so much of what was going on during that mission was testing, testing these, um, these different systems. Now, on the wall behind you, you can just see up here, is a page from this manual, um, presented and it's a very interesting page because it's actually documenting the first ever burn of that descent engine of the lunar module while docked the Apollo um, uh, command module and do you see now why these two manuals are, are so wonderful they talk to each other the testing and procedures worked out in Apollo 9 became contingencies for Apollo 13 and we can hear Eugene Cran saying, please, please. oh you can oh, hear please. I've got feedback. Suddenly got feedback. I'm okay, I can't hear him. Okay, I'll keep going. So uh, we can hear Eugene Kranz, the director, the famous director with his white waistcoat, you've seen him in the film Apollo 13, talking about both the contingency checklist, he says that we've got to, he was worried about the large amount of checklist changes in here, um, and he talks about how they had already practiced the dock stip burn in the past. So here's that. Um, a clip just now from a press conference um, just before the craft Lula th Apollo 13 went back around uh, behind the moon. Cut. Flight records uh, be following the normal course of the mission. Okay, let's close it with uh, John Harris. Uh, what single factor, if any, is giving you the most concern at this time? See, it's probably uh, one that, uh, I'd say the one thing, uh, if anything, is uh, bothering me is a large amount of checklist changes we're making. That's why we're always trying to stay several days ahead of them and verify them in the simulators, because once you've got tried and true, tried and true procedures, you like to stay with them. And uh, I think we've gone through the major portion of the checklist changes now, so I think we're pretty much over the hump from that standpoint. Uh, it's always nice to be to be operating in a mode where you've uh, used, where you're actually using procedures you've used before, and, and that's a good way to be. Checklist. By checklist, you mean re-entry checklist? Does that mean the re-entry is giving you concern? No, 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 no. I'm saying all the checklist changes we had made up to date. Uh, from a standpoint of uh, discomfort, that was about the, the major item because I think we thought we had a good handle on how to manage the systems now and uh, how to go about making this burn. Uh, we had made long dock dips burns, for instance, uh, back in the Apollo 9 mission. So we were pretty confident of those procedures. Thank you very much, Jim. <clears throat>
to clip and you heard Eugene Krantz there mention both the uh, checklist changes to the Apollo 13 contingency checklist and refer back to Apollo uh, 9. Now Mark, I wonder if you could tell us a bit, because I think you know a bit about Charlie Duke. He was the owner of this manual and his role was um, caps, Capscom. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that uh, in the context of Apollo 13. Well, absolutely. I mean, every mission, I mean, from, from Mercury onwards, has adopted um, the process of really only having one person that would communicate between Houston Mission Control and the spacecraft. And tradition had it um, that it was an astronaut. In this case, of course, they would be operating in the same shift pattern that the flight controllers would be in Houston. Uh, and Charlie Duke, by this point, was a fairly, um, very, very experienced Capcom. He'd actually been, and you'll hear his voice, during the landing of Apollo 11. So he played a critical part, both in Apollo 10 and then at Neil Armstrong's request for the landing of Apollo 11. Now, Charlie Duke, at this point, of course, has, uh, has cut his teeth on Apollo and is actually part of what was the backup crew. His commander was John Young. And the plan was that they would actually, well, it wasn't a plan. The reality was they'd actually land themselves on the moon on Apollo 16 of April 1972 almost two years from this point. Charlie Duke, of course, is acting as capsule communicator. He's also spent as support crew member a huge amount of time in the simulators with John Young, working up these procedures that they needed to rewrite very, very quickly to get the guys back, um, or to get them round the moon to do these burns effectively, building on what they knew from Apollo 9 and from what they'd, they'd worked out was the problem, ready to, to add all that together to a set of procedures that they could radio up, the crew could follow. Um, communications were tricky. Of course, they had to minimise the power requirements, the power, um, the power take within the spacecraft to maximise the duration of the batteries in the lunar module. So actually, the Capcoms were finding their headsets were full of static. They were really struggling to hear what was being said, and the whole process must have been terribly, terribly exhausting. So we've, we're in a situation now with Charlie Duke sitting as capsule communicator, reading up the procedures, and he was literally reading from the document I have on my left. It says here, for example, 100.22.00, that is 100 hours ground elapsed, elapsed time, plus 22 minutes, zero seconds. Read up, it says here for MCC5, that's the mid-course correction five. Mark, just quickly take us back to the diagram, which is on the screen, just explain. Yeah, of course. The mid -course yeah, correction. sure. By this point, of course, we've done the two big burns with the descent propulsion system. That, that, that It's done its job. It's got them pointing back at the Earth and, and heading back. But they needed a trim. Of course, they were still venting various bits and pieces in the spacecraft. They were having challenges trying to point it in exactly the right position. So they were constantly trimming the spacecraft. Uh, and, and they did this in the mid-course correction burn five, just using the attitude controllers and the lunar module. And you can see that. Um, in the slide that we've got up on the screen at the moment. And so what we're going to do now is play you a clip. But Mark talked about the communications between the Capcom uh, and the craft, these air to ground transmissions. We've got NASA have all that in their archives, all the transcripts from that communications and all the audio is available as well as some video from inside the craft. But it's fantastic material for researching these artifacts. I mean, it's partly why Mark and I so get so excited about this collection it's not just for us a pile of objects we listen to the archives and we read it and it all comes to life so here's a small clip it's on the screen at the moment the words are written out uh slide on the screen at the moment those are two images from inside the craft uh during the mission back those images are not timed exactly to when this read up came from charlie duke it just gives you a feel for what's going on in the craft but you can see cc that's capcom that's charlie duke and, he, and we're going to hear the audio of him reading up, explaining what they're about to do to try and hold the Earth. Uh, what we're really trying to do is get you in a posture so that when you see the Earth come through the window, you can uh, damper out and uh, hold, hold the Earth uh, in the window. Uh, proceeding on to the rest of page uh, 29 under RCS Press, scratch the entire uh, three steps as printed. On page 30... Uh, scratch uh, step four under the RCS press. Over. That was the read up uh, from Charlie, Charlie Drew. Now we're going to move on as we do in these podcasts to something a little different, Mark. If you could explain the format for the second half of the podcast. <laughs> 
Well, I think what we're going to do is we've introduced the, the very much the technical element. I mean, I think to actually have the Apollo 9 and Apollo 13 manuals together like that is fantastic. And it, and it helps to sort of weave that story about how, how Apollo was a series of, uh, of achievements that built on each one. Uh, but there's also a very, very personal aspect of this as well. And that's true of, of the artifacts as well. The next piece that we have is a watch strap, seemingly a, a, a piece of Velcro that was actually worn by Jack Schweikart during the Apollo 13 mission, uh, kept by him and eventually put up at auction. And that piece is with us today. Um, I, I've been careful not to frame this simply because I think it, it's just a lovely piece. It's a very personal thing that he would have kept. It is much bigger than a conventional watch strap. It's actually 18 inches in, in diameter, simply because that's the diameter of your arm when you're wearing a pressure suit. The idea was you wear it around your pressure suit, you see what the time was, you could then take that off and wear it around your wrist, which is what I thought did on his mission. There's an image on the screen now of, 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 um, of, of uh, him actually wearing it in the craft. Now, build it, building on that, what's great for Mark and I is that it is to be able to bring to you other parts of our collection. Now, we don't have time to, to talk at length about everything, which is why for this session we focused on, episode we focused on the two manuals. But we are going to bring you a few other items. Both Mark and I are fascinated by Apollo 13. Uh, Mark's been talking about the, the watch strap belonging to, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Jack Schweiger. I get mixed up with Rusty Schweiger. Okay, Jack Schweiger. Um, now, the other, uh, another story that you're familiar with, along with the Earth in the Window from the film Apollo 13, would be when they swapped, well, when they had to connect the uh, carbon dioxide scrubbers, the lithium hydroxide canisters, from the command module, and bring them into the lunar module and find a way to put a round hole into a square plug. Now, here I have one of these actual canisters. This says ground tested. It's heavy. It's four, three, four kilograms of weight, which is a sizable chunk of, of weight to take up. Uh, it's mass that you've got to get uh, in, uh, in, uh, out of Earth's orbit. Uh, I'll just leave it here for you to look at. Now, obviously this one's not flown, um, but it shows you where the connection would have been here. And they had to get this connected through a tube and they had to fabricate that connection to the lunar module. Um, and as we know, they were breathing out, there were three of them in the lunar module and they were breathing out carbon dioxide and the scrubbers were being used up too fast. The chemicals, the lithium hydroxide had to be replaced. And that was why this became so important. But they did find a solution um, and they fabricated it. And we can see in the clip coming just now uh, with a commentary from the PR man at Mission Control over the top of this, but this is live footage from within the lunar module of Fred Hayes doing a somersault um, but right next to him is the fabrication of a identical canister to this uh, attached to the lunar module. Nautical miles from Earth, the spacecraft velocity is up now to 4,928 feet per second. Uh, repeating a uh, figure passed along uh, a little while ago. The uh, flight dynamics officer reports that uh, as a result of the uh, mid-course correction, uh, the flight path angle at entry uh, is within the uh, entry corridor. The uh, flight path angle uh, currently appears to be minus 6.24 degrees at entry interface. Uh, the nominal flight path angle is uh, 6.5. And that is what the uh, mid-course correction was targeted for, uh, 6.24. So Mark, so we, we've gone through the flight plan because the, we're coming down towards Earth. They've gone into lunar uh, Earth orbit. Um, did you want to pick up the story there? Because I know you've got some exciting items uh, to do with Splashdown. But uh, what, what, talk, talk us through those last, those, those last few hours. Well, I think at this point, of course, the crew haven't really slept. They've not really eaten much. Um, they've taken on very little water. Um, the, I mean, it was almost getting out to freezing. Certainly in the command module, uh, the lunar module probably wasn't much warmer. Uh, Jack, um, sorry, no, Fred Hayes himself had actually picked up a urinary infection, was feeling pretty rough, really quite rough. And of course, uh, the all important um, part of the mission that remained really was getting rid of the service module, then getting rid of the lunar module, completely the wrong order for a conventional mission. And then just again, 
command module would be the thing that dropped through the atmosphere and brought the three crewmen home. Uh, they'd identified a location in the Pacific, I'm oh, sorry, the uh, Pacific or Atlantic, I need to check that. Pacific uh, and it was up. They're originally aiming for the Indian Ocean and they didn't want, they really wanted to get to Pacific because that's where their rescue craft were. Yeah, I mean, they had contingencies in the event that at any point in the mission, if they needed to come back, there were various splashdown zones. Um, they came back in the Pacific, which was obviously a bigger piece of uh, water and, and a bigger target. And it was the USS Iwo Jima. Um, and actually heading up the NASA recovery efforts was uh, future flight director Randy Stone. And he actually was tasked with running the quarantine procedures and systems that would have isolated the crew in a sort of three week lunar lockdown uh, because of the, the, the risk of potential lunar germs coming back. Now, of course, they did this on Apollo 12 and they did it on Apollo 11. They were still doing this on Apollo 13. It, it's actually quite ironic given that we're now in 2020, we're all in a lockdown. These guys are actually going to be in this, this three week quarantine. Uh, but actually, one upside from the mission was the fact because they hadn't been exposed to lunar, potential lunar germs. That they did not need to do that. So Randy Stone himself led the recovery process, procedures to have divers out, helicopters to actually um, lift the crewmen out of the command module uh, into a helicopter that was waiting. Once all three crew members were in the helicopter, they were actually then landed on the flight deck of the Iwo Jima. Uh, and of course, to great celebration, flight crews were, um, of course, all the recovery crews were there, a lot of NASA personnel, but also critically, of course, a lot of the world's press. And if you go on YouTube, it's all there. It's, it's really, really quite impressive to see. Uh, and there must have been tremendous, tremendous celebration, certainly in Mission Control, but also on the Iwo Jima. Um, convention had it and tradition had it. Uh, the crewmen would wear baseball caps with their names on and their missions. And I believe we've, we've got a slide of that it's up at the moment. But also uh, crew members, all crew members of the Iwo Jima, I think it was about 1,000, maybe 950 people, all had the ability to have one of these caps, uh, which was called the splashdown cap. This actually, including the jacket, which is hanging up here just to my left, was worn by that flight director, Randy Stone. So here we have a sort of wonderful final personal part. Um, this didn't fly, of course, it doesn't have to fly to tell a story, and, that, and that's really just, just as an important artifact as, as some of the other things that we've touched on. Really quite fitting. So you can imagine the celebrations that must have gone on that day and for the weeks following. It must have been tremendously exciting. And in a way, you'd think that would be the end, the end of the story, Mark. But we have one, one additional artifact. And you mentioned something interesting there. Not everything has to be flown that's of interest uh, in, 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 in historic space artifacts. And not everything has to be ridiculously uh, expensive. So I came across a, a memo, uh, six pages of paper which add a, a small coda, a, a small end story to the Apollo 13, which was about uh, a day, uh, 48 hours later, the Atomic Energy Commission flew helicopters with air sampling equipment over the trajectory of where the lunar module broke up in the atmosphere and came, and came down. And there's an image on the screen you can see now of the back of that trajectory. And what's going on there is that the, and I have my notes, uh, is that the, you can see a picture behind me, and we think this is, well, sorry, this is Alan Bean, Apollo 12, and he's pulling a canister off the side of the lunar module while it's on the surface of the moon. But of course, in Apollo 13, the lunar module was still attached to the command module and broke, de-docked and then broke up in the atmosphere. So that canister, which was full of plutonium, had to tumble its way through the atmosphere. Now they had, why did they have a canister of plutonium? Well, it was fuel for the on-surface experiments. If you've seen the film The Martian, that's how um, Watney manages to keep warm in the, uh, in the rovers. Um, he, he went and dug it up. Well, it wasn't on the moon in Apollo 13. It was coming down in the Earth's um, atmosphere. Uh, it's uh, a flask full of plutonium, but the flask was designed not to break up should on launch there be a, an abort uh, procedure required and the lunar module break up and the canister fall to Earth. 
So they were testing to see if that had been successful, that had not broken up in the atmosphere, hence if they got zero um, radiation readings, that was a good sign. They did get zero, and that's what this memo lay, lays out. And it has this wonderful diagram you can see in front of you showing roughly where they think it landed, which is about 200 miles south of the Fiji Islands in a trench 10 kilometers deep, all by design. That's where they wanted this, this canister to end up. So a piece of the uh, uh, Apollo 13 lunar module still exists not just as objects in collections like this, but actually at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean with a half-life of 830 years. It doesn't matter. Well, that's cool. I mean, I think one of the most exciting parts, I've been able to tell you the, the story of Apollo 13, hopefully from a slightly different angle than most other videos that uh, people, films that people have seen, is that we've actually brought a whole bunch of artifacts which have not been together as part of the mission for about 50 years. That's a nice thought, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's great to see you there flying by the, both those missions, one flown from Apollo 9, but one so critical used on Earth to get the crew of Apollo 13 back. And of course, there would be a mirror image of that that's flown. I don't know quite where that, that manual is. That would be interesting to find that out. But actually, I, I, the other thing, Michael, of course, is you felt compelled to, to not only just pull this together as a, as a podcast, as a key piece of this, centerpiece of this podcast, but also to write an article about it. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, just to ask uh, um, the British Interplanetary Society, who Mark and I are both members of, um, uh, uh, have, uh, have a series of publications. One of them is called Space Flight. It's up on the screen now. And an article that goes into the detail of the story we've sketched out today is, is in that uh, publication. Uh, there was also a presentation on it. You can access that through the BIS website. Um, uh, and there was even a Q&A Q afterwards. So you can follow up uh, the main story of, of this episode uh, through uh, the links we'll put up uh, on, on, on YouTube. Uh, Mark, if you just want to mention one line of what the next episode is, um, I think then we'll sign off. Well, absolutely. And I think, I think the one thing that always struck me is about Apollo 13 was, you know, it, it was a, a major malfunction. It was possibly one of NASA's greatest hours. But also, I think it would have been the easiest thing in the world to have stopped there. And they didn't. They stopped. They understood the problem, what the underlying causes were, fixed it, engineered a solution. And then, and I think this is real testament to Apollo, and then went back, not just once, twice, but for a further four missions, for even greater durations, and, to, and in the name of science. They clearly beaten the Russians, hands down, but it was in the name of science, and basically for that great endeavor of exploration. I think that, that's really quite a moving statement about Apollo 13 as well, and certainly Apollo 14. Uh, the next article we're gonna talk about is the third spacecraft of Apollo. We've talked about the command module and the lunar module, of course everybody's really quite familiar with those two very famous spacecraft. But we're going to talk about the third one, which was the backpack, that little one-man spacesuit and the backpack that kept them alive on the lunar surface over those six successful missions. So please join us for that next session. And thanks for staying with us. And there are some really fascinating leads in the links to follow. Bye now.